Welcome back. It's still TV3 New Day. And as the world grapples with COVID-19, there's also another major challenge here in Ghana. And it is about the Affirmative Action Bill. It's been about 8 to 10 years since the promulgation of the bill. And we do understand that the president in January did mention that he was dedicated to ensuring that this bill will be passed before the end of the year. Of course, understanding that COVID-19 has slowed a lot of things down, but it doesn't stop us from still having a conversation about it, especially with the women's rights organizations and CSOs who have lent their voice to ensuring parity for women in the country when it comes to decision making and law. And so in the studios today, we're going to continue that even before we have a conversation also about a stimulus package that's been set aside specifically for uh, women SME. So that will come later. But in the studios now, I have Sheila Minka Primo, who is a lawyer and a convener for Affirmative Action Bill Coalition, and Mrs. Magdalena Kanai. She's a gender and development consultant and a member of Women's Manifesto Coalition. And so I'll start off with Mrs. Mag Magdalene Kanai. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. And you're welcome to TV3 New Day. We've been talking about Affirmative Action Bill over and over again. I just want you to touch on it quickly uh, before I can also ask Madame Sheila about it, just to educate us a bit more on what exactly the Affirmative Action Bill seeks to achieve. Um, an Affirmative Action and the Affirmative Action Bill that um, we are currently looking at is uh, a document that aims to uh, alleviate the sufferings of marginalized and um, uh, vulnerable people that have been left out of development processes historically for a very long time. Mm. So it is in, in, in simple terms a remedy to address the effects of long-standing discrimination against certain groups of societies. So for instance, you can put in place laws or policies or programs or procedures, you know, that would address those um, uh, situations that have existed, that have not allowed people, certain categories of people to participate effectively in mm. national development. Okay. So I, terms, I know the focus is on women and also on persons with disability, but if you can touch a bit more on why women are at the center of this fight for the Affirmative Action Bill. Yeah, women are on the center because uh, women have been historically discriminated against and they have been marginalized to participate in national development. So, for instance, when we look at politics, uh, look at the number of women that we see in our political environment. Look at our national level, uh, just 38 women out of the 275 women that are there. When you go to the district level, it is not better. You go to the ministerial levels, it is not any better. It is so low. So because of this, there is the need for us to take deliberate um, attempts to try to address this issue. Because when we look at Ghana's population, um, the um, GSS told us that in 2010, women were 51.3% of our Ghanaian population. So it means that our women outnumber the men. And if we can imagine that so the women are sitting on the fence and the few men have to do all that they have to do to be able to develop the country to meet all our expectations. And that is why we are where we are. Mm. Because women have been left out of the development agenda. So it is important that we, we, we we try to address the hindrances that include that women are not suitable for public harina mm. and therefore they should be in the private. So the public and private dichotomy is a significant cause of women's exclusion in the public realm. Okay. And therefore, there is the need for us to take deliberate actions and the deliberate actions is the affirmative action bill that is currently seeking that it goes through parliament and through all the um, uh, legislative bodies so that it can be passed into law to address the inequality that exists. All right. Thank you, uh, Magdalene. Let me just quickly speak as well to um, Sheila. And Sheila, why do you think there's been a challenge? It's been about eight to ten years uh, since we started this campaign for the bill to be passed. What have been the challenges uh, that you have come across? 
Um, thank you very much. There have been a lot of challenges, mainly due to um, changes in the Ministry of. It's you know started off with Ministry of Women and Women and Children Affairs, and then okay. later became the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection. There have been changes in the ministers from the time it's, you know the whole initiative started effectively around 2010, 2011. Mm. So, you know, it progresses for a while and then um, there's a change. The new person would always like to start off, you know, by also reviewing and being convinced about the whole thing before mm. start continuing, etc. So that I believe that some of the major changes, I mean, these major changes in the faces of the ministers who have been responsible for this bill okay. have resulted but in... But is that not sad? Indeed. Because, I mean, the gender ministry, of course, is always headed by a woman. And so they should obviously understand the need to even push this further. I mean, if there's a change in party in power, it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to now go back and relook at the issues, especially when it's about oh. women, you know, uh, gaining more ground. I'm talking about is not, yeah, there was one major, there's been changes in political parties, but it's, there's also been even changes in the people who've headed that ministry, okay? So within the same party, uh, particular, the, the, I remember, I recall that, um, you know, there's a technical committee was put together to actually collect secondary material and start putting, helping to put um, drafting instructions together. A particular minister started within a particular party. Later on, there were changes. The, 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 there wasn't a change in government per se, but there were changes in the faces. Okay. And it's a human thing. A new minister comes, um, there are a whole lot of policies and laws which are being drafted. They need to understand it because when it goes to cabinet, they need to go and defend it. Mm. Okay. So by the time they understand it and start the process, there's a change. And then, um, so the, the major change in shifting political yeah. parties was in 2016 mm -hmm. when a um, totally new government came in. But previously, the other ministers too had changed. And then when the new government came into, we had a minister that was we were working with, and then she also got change from yeah. 2017. But, but that means that, I mean, we're expecting elections to happen uh, by the end of this year. We all can't predict what may happen. But just in case another party comes into power, that means that we're going to be taking another two, three steps back because maybe they'll have to study, um, you know, the whole bill again to see what needs to be done, what needs to be changed and all that. That's a problem. Shouldn't we have a policy that makes it easier for us to still continue the process even if the party in power is not able to pass it into law? Well, oh, sorry. This is addressed to Madeleine, or it's myself. No, to you, Sheila, I'm still with you. Okay. So basically, um, like I said, it's, a, it's a very human thing. It's a human challenge. And so I think that for those of us on the outside who have consistently been trying to follow up and see the bill in place, it's also up to us to maybe up our, our, our game Mm. and make sure that if there's another change, we are able to let the person who comes know where the journey has been and where we are and quickly bring this person on. Because it's a constitutional issue. Yeah. What we are pushing for is not just a wish. Ms. Madeline has outlined the reason why it's so important. And I think that um, once um, whoever comes understands that there's a real serious need to have this law in place, because our constitution requires this to be in place. Yeah. Ghana's international obligations also requires this to be in place. So I think that for those of us on the outside, we need to keep pushing more. And we are hoping that whoever is a minister at that particular ministry would also see the agency on this matter and put it very high yeah. on the agenda. Yes, you, you said if there could be a policy, yes. I think when they come, I believe that there, there are some handing over notes, etc. And I'm, what we need to ensure is that this is puts as one of the priority bills that okay. whoever is responsible for that ministry which is hosting this bill. All right, let me go back to Mrs. Magdalene Kanai. So let's mention a few of these other countries that may have gone through the process. We're still able to go ahead with the passage of the bill. And now that has become a major benefit for women in that country. If you can give us some examples and how they were able to achieve success in that field. I, I just want to take us a little back to what we have discussed and to say that I really wish that uh, we don't have to 
uh, wait until another government. At your introduction, you did mention that even in January uh, 2017, in the State of the Nation address, the, the president, in his good message, mentioned that in his tenure, he's going to pass the affirmative action bill into law. So I'm hoping that this still stands because it is one of the manifesto promises. So the good government of um, uh, His Excellency Nana Akufuado is going to see that this bill is passed. Mm. But to go to your question now, um, many countries um, have really uh, taken a step ahead of Ghana after signing on to the international um, conventions and protocols mm. to achieve gender equality. Uh, for instance, when we look at Senegal, Senegal has uh, passed the parity bill and ensured okay. that um, they are going to get equal numbers of women and men um, in all positions and in, in politics. Uh, when we look at Tanzania, when we look at Uganda, mm. they have all put in place some kind of affirmative action to ensure that women are properly represented. We look at Rwanda now, currently they have about 65% that are women in decision-making uh, um, positions at parliament and even also at the lower levels. Mm -hmm. They have to take deliberate steps, pass affirmative action bills, either you know, stand alone or incorporate in their constitution. And then it becomes mandatory that they must take these steps to ensure that the marginalized groups and those that have been discriminated historically can participate. Mm. So um, we have many uh, countries that are good examples for us to look at and okay. to ensure that we can take those measures also to go. So I really look up to the president that he should not fail Ghanaian women because yeah. he made it a, a, a manifesto promise starting from December 27, I mean, January 2017, that he made this statement. He should keep to his word. And okay. Ghana, uh, women of Ghana will hail him. Now, former president of the United States, Barack Obama, mentioned once, it wasn't too long ago where he mentioned that women are indeed better leaders, um, you know, than men. And this started a whole conversation about women in power and the need to also ensure parity. But at the same time, there were some people that also mentioned that, well, yes, if they are better leaders, they should fight for the position just like men and not ask, you know, for a law that ensures that they also get the chance to rule as well. What do you make of that? Um, I think that, yes, it, 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 is, it is true. And women are trying their best. But we understand the situation where women are coming from. You know, the historical discrimination against women and also um, the marginalization and the socialization per se for women generally. Mm. You know, women are socialized to learn to be subordinates to men. So we have been socialized in such a way that our place is supposed to be in the kitchen. And for that matter, even education is be it does not become important at all. We are expected to stay and learn and be socialized by our, our, our mothers, how to cook well and how to become better wives and better uh, daughter-in-laws to our uh, husband's parents yeah. and so on. So because of that kind of socialization, there are those kinds of uh, hindrances, barriers that have held women and for us to address it, there is the need for us to take deliberate and proactive measures, mm. actions, in such a way that we can address them. Um, when you look at the educational system currently, and if you give the, 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 the girl child and the boy child equal opportunities to be in school and provide them with equal resources, you, you don't see that the boys are naturally better than the boys mm, than the girls, the girls yeah. but it is because of the opportunities so let us give equal opportunities and when um, this is addressed the fact is that an affirmative action law does not become a permanent instrument it is to address the situation and mm. when that situation 
is addressed, it is redrawn. Okay. So, okay. so it, when the situation is addressed, then the bill will be redrawn. That's the yes, plan? the bill will be redrawn. Okay. All right. Madam Sheila, I'll take your last words before we go. I mean, COVID-19 has exposed the system. I mean, entirely, the, the world in, in totality. And so here in Ghana, what are some of the things that, um, you know, COVID-19 has brought about concerning women and the challenges that we're facing? Um, thank you very much. I think that um, it has brought a number of things, including increase in violence. Mm. It's also brought some economic challenges as well, which has had an impact on women. The period of lockdown, you know, resulted in people having to live with maybe some partners who have potential to be violent. And the continued um, period of isolation, you know, resulted in a lot of violence taking place. There are also many um, female headed households or women who have custody of their children who have to provide for them. Usually they have challenges getting their male counterparts to contribute. And therefore, when they couldn't go to their markets to sell, to do their work, it became a very big challenge. Yeah. And I'm sure you've heard the news, I think this week, in places like the central region, the report which showed that there's been an increase in teenage pregnancy. Yes. In some places, 3, or so, as a result yes. of this COVID and yeah. the limitations of people's movements, some people saw the easy prey when it mm -hmm. comes to sex as the young girls in the environment. And that has resulted in a lot of teenage pregnancy. Yeah. So it has had a lot of negative impacts, which has certain gender. Okay. And, and, and as a result, what would be your final words as we still promulgate the passage of the Affirmative Action Bill before we wrap up? What I would say is that the, our constitution, Article 17 of Ghana's constitution, you know, which says that there should be no discrimination on the basis of gender. In its Article 17, 4 says that where there has been historically discrimination against any gender, there's nothing wrong if Parliament comes out with a law to right the wrong, as um, Madam Kanai um, has indicated. So we are saying that there is constitutional backing for the Affirmative Action mm. Bill, and therefore we would call on the president to honor his manifesto promise to okay. make sure that this law gets passed before um, the end or the close of the year. All right. Apart from Article 17, the other part of the constitution which also calls for ensuring that there's gender um, gender issues are taken into consideration when it comes to appointments, etc., mm -hmm. etc. So we would okay. like to see this law in place before the close of the year. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Sheila Minka Primo is a lawyer and a convener for Affirmative Action Bill Coalition. And Mrs. Magdalene Kanai is a gender and development consultant and a member of the Women's Manifesto Coalition.